Tuesday, September 1st, the joint meeting for rules and open government committee committee of the whole. Uh, Tony, could you use some roll? Arenas? Davis? Here. Camus? Jones? Here. Locardo? Here. We have a quorum. And okay, Tony, thank you. I'm here as well. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Oh, we, we have one here. Great. All right, let's start <clears throat> with a review of the agenda for September the 1st. And uh, there are recommended changes on beginning on pages five and six. I'd recommend that we start, uh, it's already scheduled for 11 a.m., okay? Um, any changes there or pages seven and eight? Um, pages nine and 10. Expect there'll be a lot of public input on 8.2. So we have that scheduled. Okay, immediately after 8.1. Okay, makes sense. Short agenda, but lots of lots to talk about. Um, we also have some ads. Um, consent item, and then a root. I'm trying to understand the ad of eight. X review of the September one council agenda. Hi, this is Tony. Um, the memo for that is at the very bottom of the ad sheet. So I'm scrolling to it right now. Oh, I see. We also have a request for closed session to begin at nine. Oh, okay. So this is a request to be adding this under I assume to, to avoid, ordinarily this would go through the sunshine process, but this is because it's somehow or another related to COVID. Is that the point? Uh, Councilmember Pross, are you with us? I am, sorry, I just put a chip in my mouth. Um, okay. But yes, um, the only reason that the card rooms are um, right, right in need of operating outdoors under a tent is due to the COVID restrictions. Okay, so you wanted to add that. So, so Mayor, we're we're adding the the other eight uh, X a little further down, which is um, uh, further modifications of um, the use of, of sidewalks and and parklets. Yeah. I do believe the council member Perales is now adding on to the item that we're adding. So I got expand to card rooms. Okay. Could, could I just check in, Dave, with, in terms of bandwidth? I don't know if you guys have, and everyone's even looked at outdoor gaming and how to regulate and whether and how. Um, is that something that's e feasible to consider on the first, or would you rather have some time? Well, I think if, if we consider on the first, if there, there, are, there will definitely need to be quite a bit of work in terms of you know, the logistics and, and framework for it. Um, you know, I, I think we're okay with, with adding on to this item, recognizing that we will need to come, you know, follow through with a, with an implementation plan that will probably take a while. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know that we are trying to get a lot of stuff done relating to outdoor commerce and, um, and the Alfresco initiative. And I just want to make sure we got the basic stuff done before we start thinking about what may be a whole lot harder here. Yeah, so this this next state, the 8X that we're, we're showing here, and I, I don't know if anyone's on that can help me with the particulars, but it, it does kind of round out um, the Alfresco program. And so that, that, that will be moving forward. And then obviously the card rooms is a, a newer piece, much newer piece that we'll need to figure out. Okay. But it wouldn't hold up the other items. I got it. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just share my own concern just generally about Alfresco, which is we've spent an enormous amount of time trying to get everything right on the ordinances and all the changes. And the feedback we're hearing is people don't know about it. It's not, you know, we haven't been doing outreach because we haven't had the bandwidth to do the outreach because we're yeah. spending so much time trying to dot the I's and cross the T's legally. And, and you know, what we were hoping to do was have a program where we basically say, everybody just go do it. Um, and we'll try to figure out how to do it perfectly over time, but let's try to get the word out. And we just haven't had that opportunity. So anyway, that's my, my concern. And so adding more work to go cross T's and dot I's when we really should be spending that time talking to businesses, that's, that's what my great concern is. Um, so uh, let's go to the public and we'll come back for, for, the, for the panel for discussion. This is on the September 1st agenda. Mr. Beekman. Thank you that for at least uh, the fourth week in a row now, there, will, uh, there are local community energy items in next week's city council agenda. I hope this can be of interest to everyday community. With item 3.3 in this period of modifying and lessening uh, the effects of COVID-19 in the next few years and the needs for overall healthier diets, food storage and food distribution, it has seemed clear that uh, the need of decent minded workers rights and human rights around COVID-19 for workers in the California Central Valley and other farming areas should be considered important. With uh, item 3.5, commercial linkage fees is an old important issue in San Jose. In this time of COVID-19, the stock market itself is continuing to know how to develop incredibly vast money-making systems. From this, developers and corporate entities are currently sitting on and amassing large corporate reserves at this time. It should be an important question at this time how the creative ideas to continually make money, uh, how, how can this help with the day-to-day -day needs of everyday communities, local government, and human services? Hopefully in this next few years, we'll be moderating and slowly reducing the threat of COVID-19. How can there be simple open dialogue from all sides at this time of city government, union, developers, real estate, and other parts of the community? And towards the interesting progressive ideas that were developing Santa Clara County in the South Bay pre-COVID-19. The ideas that everyone of a community can be accounted for and taken care of are important reminders of our human capabilities, decency, and sustainability. How can we continue these good ideas we are working towards in San Jose pre-COVID-19? I think these are the honest ways to work through the future questions of a major recession or depression. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Jefferson B. Cannon. Hey, Mayor and Council. Um, yeah, just a, a, for a point of clarification, appreciate the uh, uh, the time certain for 8.2, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for 8.1 to follow 8.2 in sequence, um, but would encourage uh, uh, the committee to consider mm -hmm. just clarifying that uh, uh, the time certain for 8.1 8 is uh, no later than 6 p.m. And then for 8.2 is uh, sequentially after 8.1, but no earlier than 1.30. Um, so for the public, it's kind of hard to articulate, you know, it says 1.30, but you know, it's going to be after six because it's related to this one. Um, so it may be worth just clarifying that they're both uh, no, no earlier than 6 p.m. And, and keeping that uh, sequential uh, reference, which I think makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of members of the public that are going to want to talk on both. Um, appreciate the time. I'm sorry, did you say not later than 6 p.m. or not earlier than 6 p.m.? I'm sorry, not, er not earlier. I, I, I apologize there. But, it, but you'll see on the, I don't know if it was because you guys did one, one earlier than the other, but one says six and one says 1.30, but they rep, but 8.2 references, it's sequentially after 8.1. You get what I'm saying? It's just confusing. Like if you followed both of those statements, it would come after six or, or, or no earlier than six. And so it probably makes sense to just, just say that, right? Does that make sense? This is Tony. We left the 130 reference because it was noticed for 130. Okay. I do understand that that's confusing, um, but it will come after 8.1 after 6 p.m. Okay. But we can change that today, Tony, right? I mean, Jeffrey yeah. has an excellent point. 
yes, it is confusing. I just left the 130 reference because that's how it was noticed. And I didn't want to run afoul of anything legally with noticing. Perfect. Appreciate it. Thanks for the clarity. Okay, cool. Uh, Robert Lindo. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for your time. And uh, I wanted to thank you for considering this. I wasn't sure when I was going to be speaking, but um, obviously calling in to speak in support of um, the modification of the current um, city council uh, emergency services order for expanding outside uh, permissible businesses outside um, casino matrix and, and I know Bay one ones on the call as well are both prepared to similar to card rooms across the state um, which are opening outdoors uh, some started last week some will continue this week um, we're prepared to move in that direction uh, it's a regulated process obviously um, the Bureau of Gambling Control will be in in working in conjunction with us we hope that the Division of Gaming Control will be working with us allow us to bring back hundreds of employees to work safely outside uh, mm -hmm. in addition to that obviously um, we thank council member Perales for putting together um, their memo on the agenda item but would uh, bring a, a great deal of revenue to the city through the card room tax which currently um, the card rooms are, are not generating any revenue obviously and are losing tons of money just to stay closed so um, the process should be safe it should be regulated um, and Obviously, we, we would love to work with the city on accomplishing um, that objective in any way that, that can be uh, feasible for, uh, for everyone. So if anyone has any questions, obviously, I'm, I'm able to answer them. And I know you'll hear from uh, hopefully Bay 101, and hopefully some of our employees will be on the line as well about their desire to come back to work. And uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Robert. Uh, stay with us. I want to ask a couple questions, if you could. Thanks. Uh, Nico Minardi. Welcome, Nico. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I'm basically reiterating what Rob said there. I'm, I'm representing uh, the ownership group of Casino Matrix and usually he's much more eloquent at getting his point across so I don't need to get too detailed here but our goal is, as he said, to open up outdoors, get our employees back to work, contribute to revenues to San Jose and as well as uh, give all of the benefits back to our employees as well. That's something that's important to us. I know these are unprecedented times. So we appreciate your guys' flexibility in considering this. And we really, it's, our goal is just to mirror the rest of the card room industry and opening outdoors. So again, thank you. And here for any questions as well. Thank you. Uh, Byron Gregory. Byron, welcome. Hello. Thank you and good afternoon all. The San Jose City Council is encouraged to allow the reopening of COVID-19 safety compliant card clubs within the city limits, placing the health and safety of employees and guests first by addressing entrance requirements, safety equipment, cleaning, and physical distancing requirements. Each are assured a healthy, safe environment in which to conduct permissible activities no different than any other activity already allowed under COVID-19 guidelines throughout the state. As approved by voters, gaming is a desirable and safe activity when conducted following established COVID-19 safety regulations. Card clubs have provided the city in writing their COVID-19 safety plans, meeting federal, state, county, and city guidelines to which the card clubs can be held accountable. Please allow the San Jose card clubs to join other card clubs throughout the state already open, utilizing their written COVID-19 plans. There's an entire division funded by the card club within the city, the Division of Gaming, ready to ensure that the guidelines are followed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron W. Welcome. Uh, Ron, your device appears to be muted right now. We're not able to hear you yet. Uh, my apologies. It's Ron Werner um, at Bay 101. 
We're here uh, echoing the support uh, that you heard from the prior three speakers for uh, looking at getting the card rooms uh, opened outdoors. Uh, there are several card rooms around the state that have, have already opened outdoors. Uh, we believe that they're uh, safe, uh, being uh, subject to regulation. They're, they are well aware of the COVID-19 issues and practicing uh, 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 public distancing and protocols. Uh, I'm here to, if you have questions, to answer your questions regarding uh, opening outdoors for Bay 101. Thank you for your time. And also, I'd like to thank Councilman Perales, his staff, and the city staff for moving this matter forward on today's agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eddie Chong? Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and City Council members. Eddie Chong, Director of Government Relations at the Silicon Valley Organization, the region's Chamber of Commerce, representing 1,200 businesses throughout the region. I'm here today to speak in support of the card rooms being able to expand their operations to outdoor gaming and outdoor dining. Card rooms are an important um, uh, por portion of our tax base for the City of San Jose, and especially when the City of San Jose is facing a severe budget deficit we really need to focus on all potential revenue options to make sure that San Jose is fiscally resilient uh, during this COVID recession. One more thing is that we really need to focus on helping businesses find ways to safely reopen and to find ways to help displaced workers get back on their feet as soon as possible. This is one step towards that goal. The city of San Jose should really focus on amending their land use policies to allow the card room to be able to expand outdoors. And that includes gaming and dining. Thank you so much for your consideration of my comments. Thank you. All right, coming back to the panel, I just want to, um, I know Nico Lenardi or, or Robert Lindo want to answer this, or for that matter, Ron Warner, I, I would just be interested in knowing uh, from the standpoint of the county rules, to your knowledge, are you, are you able to operate outdoors under the existing county rules given this, the fact we're still on the state list? Um, I'll jump in first. This is Rob Lindo again. Uh, thanks for the question. So we've been working with the Santa Clara County and, and Jeff Smith over there on, initially we were working on our reopening indoors process. And right. uh, our last communication with him was right before the governor closed the indoor operations of card rooms and restaurants. At that point, um, uh, Jeff's response was that we could open outdoors in uh, as long as we could comply with the risk mitigation order, which we can comply with outdoors. Um, and he'd uh, spoken with county council about that, and that was their position at the time. So yes, it is um, It is our belief that we could open, despite being on the watch list, because the watch list uh, restricts the indoor activity, not the outdoor activity. So we feel pretty confident about that on the um, on the county level, for sure. Okay, and I assume you guys are trying to, you're trying to figure out the procedures now, but Assuming you'd have to be much more thinly populated around the tables, you can't have as many people per table, is that right? Yeah, so then anyone else can jump in. Sorry, I'm just rolling through. The state, um, the governor's office and the California Gambling Control Commission have each issued certain detailed recommendations and regulations, which involve um, physical distancing, uh, mask wearing at the tables, but also the um, placing of plexiglass and permeable barriers between the players. Um, if you do the impermeable glass or impermeable barriers between the players and the players are wearing masks and the cards are changed and cleaned frequently and the chips are also clean, we're entitled to, according to those state regulations and the governor's recommendations, operate um, the tables with essentially as many players as you could fit, provided that you do have the barriers in between. If you don't have the barriers and you don't have the masks, uh, well, the masks are required. If you don't have the barriers between the players, then it's half the seating capacity for the tables. We can't operate with full capacity on the tables with the barriers, so there will be restrictions on the number of players. The tables will be placed um, a physically distanced apart at, at Casino Matrix. They'd be 10 feet apart. Um, this is outdoors. And um, all the players would be wearing masks, and either they're provided or, or they can wear their own. And also they'll be offered the opportunity to wear gloves if they wish so. Um, so yeah, we are backline betting. I mean, all those folks who I know would typically crowd together, right, for backline betting. I assume you have to thin that out, don't you? 
the backline betting uh, issue is is something that we've discussed, and Bay 101 might want to jump in on that as well. Um, the players would if uh, be able to place a backline bet um, as long as they remain physically distanced from the other players after making the bet. That was that was the intention at this time, although um, it's not one of those things that's addressed specifically in the gaming regulations. It's something that we would be willing to work with uh, Division of Gaming Control in the city um, on, at least from the casino matrix perspective. But it's something we would like to preserve if possible. Okay. And the reason why I'm probing on all this is I'm just trying to understand how hard or simple it's going to be to regulate people in a setting where they're going to have to be proximate to a table or and be able to visibly see what's going on in the table. And I, I'm just trying to understand how, how clear the rules are that's going to make it either hard or easy for us to keep on coming out with regs and figure all this out. Um, I understand. So that's all I'm in understanding. Do we, do we really want to just ram this down staff's throat or do we want to give them a chance to think about it? Um, well, okay. I'm sorry, Rob. Really quickly, if you if you were to take a look at the California Gambling Control's um, emergency regulations uh, for sanitation plans that just came out and became effective on uh, Friday the 21st, all of the regulations that the card rooms that around the state are required to follow indoor or outdoor on physical distancing, training for COVID-19 procedures, cleaning pr procedures are all laid out there. So in essence, um, in a conjunction with the, the governor's uh, checklist and also um, industry guidance. I think that it would be fairly straightforward for the city, the Division of Gaming Control, um, to essentially, you know, adopt those and then make them the regulatory scheme that the city would use to monitor. We'll still have full camera coverage. We'll still have, um, we'll essentially be operating everything one-to-one -one that we would be doing indoors that you're already regulating just outdoors with open air and greater distancing between between the uh, tables and all the other COVID-19 procedures. So, we'll oh, I think we lost you, Robert. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I don't know where you lost me, but I was just saying. Right, we got, got you just till the very end. Okay, we're just here to cooperate with you, work with the city and its, its planning department and event staff and um, we're very confident. We've already started moving forward, spending large amounts of money to get this thing going just because we don't know when we'll be back up and running indoors. And even if we go indoors and we end up having to go back outdoors, this is just a really great way for us to keep people um, employed, keep revenue coming back to the city and, and keep everyone safe. As you know, the tribal casinos have been open for months now and the State, the card rooms are just trying to trying to follow suit in, in terms of going outdoors, whereas everyone else seems to be sticking indoors on the tribal side. So, okay, then for Robert and for everyone else, I just in terms of my own view on this, I know I'm only just one vote out of eleven, but it's going to be really important for me to know that the county agrees that this is just a cut and paste of whatever the state regs are, uh, and that there aren't health concerns that are. Um, that perhaps are not fully protected through the state reg. So anyway, it would be helpful for us to know whenever this does come forward, uh, if it's Tuesday or whenever, that the county has taken a look at those state regs and agrees that this is something we can just cut, cut and paste. Um, okay, coming back to the panel then, uh, Councilman Camus. Thank you, Mayor. And so I had a, two points. At, at first, I don't, I don't see why this has to be super complicated for staff. It doesn't have to be bludgeoning over the head. I think uh, it could be just allowing them the same type of uh, the ability, uh, you know, as the alfresco, basically add them to allowed uses and then use the state's guidelines. So I'm very supportive of this effort. And, and quite frankly, you know, that this is uh, almost $20 million worth of revenues that these card rooms uh, which are legally operating for years now have been providing the city something that you know we will sorely need uh, revenues as you know to close some of our budget issues and, and, and if we could do it safely um, much like you know casinos in Las Vegas and what have you have been you know and they're indoors you know if we could do this outdoors safely uh, I'm, I'm very much supportive of it and I'm supportive of putting this on uh, as an addition to the uh, discussion in the September 1st meeting. Um, that being said, I'm also uh, becoming quite um, 
I should say, tired by the end of the day uh, because of such long meetings. You know, it, it, I, have, I don't even remember any meeting now anymore that lasted before till midnight. I mean, they're all, they all seem to be going to midnight. And um, if, you, if we want to lighten up the meeting, there's nothing stopping us from, from uh, uh, you know, postponing 8.1, uh, the, the, you know, the, the policy. Uh, so, I mean, 8.1, I think, could be easily deferred to another time where we actually will be able to concentrate on the things that they're talking about. And, and I would prefer, I don't know if my other colleagues would would support this, but deferring it one week so that we don't have such meaty, 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 <laughs> meaty items all together uh, on the same agendas. So I'll make a motion to um, approve uh, the addition of uh, Council Member Perales's memo to the, uh, to the meeting uh, and, uh, and ask to defer uh, item 8.1 for one week. I'm, I'm going to second, but I also want to hear from staff in terms of. Yeah, if I could just offer whatever. I, I, yeah, let's hear from staff, but I, I'm concerned about separating those two items. They both are going to invite um, a large number of people in the public to weigh in and having those same people weigh in on consecutive meetings is a really bad use of everyone's time, theirs and ours. So I, I just think that A1 and A2 should be heard. Um, Are we gonna hear them at least together so that we don't, I mean, I mean, I know that they're different subjects. They're, they're a little bit different and that's why I kind of want to separate them and discuss them in a, in a really different manner. Um, item 8.2 is specifically for commercial impacts and may not have anything to do with 8.1, quite frankly, it, they, they are different. Uh, I see it, and uh, anyway, so I would, I'd love to hear from everyone else, but I, okay. I do see them as very different topics. Okay. Uh, and Mayor, if, if it would be helpful, um, just to kind of share a little bit of the, a preview of what's ahead for us, because uh, I do very much appreciate the, um, the length of these meetings, and we've been doing our best. Um, there is no meeting on the 8th. Um, the meeting on the 15th, we will have the preliminary after action report and also from the, the um, protests. And we also have the changes to the duty manual on rubber bullets. Um, and we also have the, the video issue coming forward, I believe. So we've kind of identified that September 15th is a lot of the police reform activities. We do expect a pretty full agenda on the 22nd as well, which will have other housing related items. Um, and then on the 29th, another very full agenda. So unfortunately the next four agendas are going to be, I'm um, afraid to say very much uh, like this. If, if the 22nd has housing related items, can't we add it to the 22nd agenda? Um, there, there's a lot on the 22nd. Um, you know, I, from my perspective, and I really understand the concern, but from my perspective, the next four meetings are gonna be very long unless we're prepared to really push things out into October and November. Or we're prepared to constrain ourselves and how long we like to talk. <laughs> that is always another option, which uh, the, we have not yet quite demonstrated that capacity for restraint. Um, and if it, if it helps, I, I think we identified for the council yesterday that we had proposed not to do a 3.1 on the 15th because we so we are doing our best to try to you know manage the agendas and put like items or you know group the items according to kind of the uh, the, the the community interest okay thank you uh councilman frost yeah thank you um and and i'm gonna kind of focus on uh the, the card room issue here versus the they put one debate that's going on. Uh, I'll let you guys iron that out. Um, so I appreciate uh, Council Member Camus making that motion uh, and Vice Mayor Jones seconding that. Uh, and and, and Council Member Camus mentioned it already that, and Dave, maybe you can tell me if I'm correct, but I believe our budget that we adopted projected 17 million uh, for this, this coming year in revenues for the card rooms. 
I, I believe that's correct. Yeah. And traditionally, it's it's been roughly around 19 million. So we were estimating uh, a potentially two million dollar, you know, difference or shortfall on what we traditionally get. We we know that we're already a few months in to this fiscal year, and they haven't operated at all. And so if we hope to generate any bit of, of revenue from these card rooms, uh, they need to begin operating. Not to mention, obviously, all the individuals that they can put back to work. Um, and so I, I didn't even know this was, was an opportunity. Um, I appreciate Rob giving me a call, reaching out and saying, hey, uh, we, you know, we have this opportunity. Card rooms up and down the state are going to take advantage of it with uh, the state orders. Uh, and then uh, it had looked like the, the county uh, had not prohibited this as well. And as uh, they were going through the motions to try and work out, as you can imagine, all the challenges of getting uh, huge tents and having camera systems, uh, sort of the one-to-one -one that Rob is talking about from the indoor operations, bringing those outdoor, um, they determined the, the biggest hurdle which was that uh, our emergency order actually uh, prohibits it. And so um, that I think was, you know, that, that, that's why for me, I wanted to give staff the, the earliest heads up possible because I do recognize uh, that there's going to be a bit of work that goes into this. Um, so I would appreciate that this does get added to the agenda item for next week. I, and, and, and I recognize there may be, you know, staff is not going to, uh, work a miracle before Tuesday. That's our hope is that they can look at the regulations that the state has laid out, maybe confirm with the county. And if it is uh, a, an easy cut and paste, um, we know that card rooms are going to be operating in, uh, under these regulations up and down the state. Um, and so would, would love to get that opportunity for them uh, next Tuesday for us to vote on. Uh, but at least what this does is it can get the conversation started, can get staff's head around it, if, uh, if we can bring it there and then hopefully they can get back in business as soon as possible uh, and, and being able to generate that tax revenue again that we've, uh, we've already estimated. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the, that, that you know, with the number of months that they've been out of business, we, we are already uh, overestimating that. Um, and so definitely appreciate uh, the uh, support of the Rules Committee to add this to the agenda for next week. And, and then hopefully get uh, all of our, our council colleagues to support it next week. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate the comments. And, you know, <clears throat> I've got no problem with, with this coming to council. I guess I'm more concerned about the amount of staff involvement. And uh, as I said before, it sure would help a lot if we had really clear guidance from the county uh, that they've signed off on whatever the state rules are. Um, so city staff isn't going out there with measuring tape and trying to figure it all out. And so anyway, I, I'm fine with that. But what I'm not really fine with is the idea of displacing an anti-displacement policy with card clubs. <laughs> and um, I, I would really rather keep those together. But that's my personal vote. Um, I understand others may feel differently. Uh, we got to bite the bullet. We got to have a lot of heavy topics to take up. And frankly, I think we all need to be much more self-disciplined about how much time we're taking in comment. And that will be most effective enabling us to uh, really address all the many, many issues we have to deal with this time. Any comments, questions? I, I, I don't disagree with you, Mayor. I'm just <laughs> stating the fact that these meetings have been taking up till midnight and I, and I feel that they're very different items. And right. I honestly don't think that there's gonna be a huge discussion around, around the card room uh, thing because I think it's just an addition. Um, and, I, and I do agree, let's hear from the, the I'd love to get the, uh, the county to, to give us a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down on their ideas. Uh, on, on uh, the ability for the card rooms to open their doors, because I think a lot of other um, counties are allowing uh, such things to happen. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts before we vote? Okay, vote from Tony. Did the, uh, did the motion the motion included the uh, 8.2 not before six, right? And the nine o'clock closed session start time? Nine o'clock um, closed session stop, stop, uh, start time is, is fine. And what was the other question? 
uh, 8.2, not before six. 8.2, not before six, and we are, and it and it still includes the deferment of 8.1. It if would that's include okay the still. deferment of 8.1, but yeah. right now 8.2 is showing not before 1.30. Understood, yes. Yeah. Does this include the other ads on the ad sheet? Yes. With the sunshine waiver? Yes. Okay. Um, Arenas? Davis? Yes. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? No. Going back to Arenas? Yes, what? sorry about that. Thank you. And for the record, my, my objection again was to the deferral of 8.1. I think those matters should be heard on the same day. Okay. Uh, we are now on to May Mayor. Sorry, I, I had my hand up. I don't know. If maybe it was a little late. Okay, Councilmember Perros. Uh, I, 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 and and I know you already took your vote, but my question was in regards to item uh, on the agenda number seven point one. Uh, was that included in that motion to drop that from next week's agenda? That's what's on the agenda now. Um, so we approve whatever's on the agenda, but we can reconsider it. Uh, this so, is yeah. on town. Yeah. So I apologize. I. I yeah. I wanted to try to get in before you took the vote for the full agenda. I thought you were initially going to just uh, vote to to include the the, the card room item, uh, but but you you took a vote on everything, and so my my ask would be that we uh, we actually keep that item on the agenda next uh, next Tuesday. Yeah. That we don't uh, that we don't remove it. Um, it's been a rather contentious item for the Japantown community. And uh, unfortunately, our Parks Commission uh, was not well informed when they made their recommendation. Uh, and, and in fact, made some disper disparaging remarks around John Highland and, um, and why they felt it was, you know, th that the park should not be named after this individual, that actually the, the Japanese community in Japantown really, uh, truly praised him um, and, and, and really wanted it to be named after, uh, after him. And so I feel that, that delaying this again and bringing it back to the parks commission uh is going to be a further insult uh and add insult to injury and it's gonna it's certainly gonna rile up a community that's already upset with me quite frankly um and the, the parks commission uh and our parks department um I, I have no intent on on naming it anything different this community is unified around this name um i'd like to keep that on the agenda for next Tuesday. And again, I, I apologize. I, I raised my hand. I know you, you took the vote, but um, I wanted to see if that could be that could remain. Right. Thanks. So is there a motion for reconsideration of the motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, let's uh, does staff want to be heard before we take a vote. Well, we can be here now or, or, or after you reconsider uh, probably, um, you know, I, I think John Cicerelli's on. Uh, I'll just say this, you know, I think I think John saw the opportunity with the fact that the, the park won't be built for some time, the opportunity to regroup with the community and see if we can resolve some of the contention. Um, I certainly respect Council Member Perales' understanding of the issues out there, um, but it seemed like we had an opportunity given the time to, to try to, to regroup. Okay. Uh, John, did you want to say anything? No? Uh, I can add, yeah. So. But, but I think they've mostly summarized it, but just to, you know, 2023 is the opening of this park. And I wanted to avoid a situation where we had community members in the, in the Parks and Rec Commission sort of at odds. Um, you know, there's been a, a lot of letter writing since the Park Commission's decision. Um, and then the, some of the Park Commissioners now, you know, feel they need to defend themselves and, and agree it's a contentious issue. I think that as staff, we probably didn't uh, do a good enough job uh, preparing the commission with with all the history about Heinlein, but um, you know we've started a new process um, around parking, and it actually gets a lot more community engagement than we've had in the past. Um, and the the Heinlein name came in like three different ways. It was Heinlein or Heinlein Town or Heinleinville, and so different people voted on those, and so no one Heinlein name got the top vote. Um, and so the commission focused on the one with the top vote, was, which was a Japanese sounding name um, and well, actually a Japanese name, not Japanese sounding. 
it, but then when you looked at all the Heinlein combined together, it was, was more interest in that name. Um, and then as I started reading the letters that were coming in after the decision, I just thought it made some good sense to go back and look, let's just invite everybody back to the table because not everybody who wrote a letter was at the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. Um, and so not all of them were able to express their opinion to the commission. Now the commission's got these letters they can review. I, I feel like we can get to a better place than we are now rather than sort of have this out in front of the council. So that's what I was really looking to try to do. Okay. Councilor Camus? Yeah, well, I, I merely wanted to hear from John Cicerelli and why why it was dropped. And and I don't know now that I want to hear from Council Member Perales to see if, you know, it. I, I, I don't mind, uh, you know, the, this having the, the commission and the, you know, and the council, I, I, I don't want to see a public fight on this. And it wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't it be good to have a couple of week cool off period and sort of the meeting of the minds, if you will. Are you, sorry, are you asking me? Good. Um, You're the one who was asking to, to, to keep it on. So yes. Yeah, so um, I don't disagree there. As far as the timeline goes, there is time. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. But I actually think it, it would exasperate the problem if we were to delay it. And the reason why is because the Japantown community is already so frustrated. Um, and they, they believe as though that the, the sort of the, the city is kind of out to maybe, you know, get them in, in some regards and that the in cahoots with the commission and, and, um, and that's not the reality. So, um, but unfortunately, a delay is not going to help. Um, this community thinks that a delay uh, would be to just delay the inevitable, which would be in their mind, trying to change the name somehow. So their belief would be that the commission wants to justify why they, you know, uh, why they don't want to name it Highlandville. And there's really no convincing that I can do at the moment. I have tried, I'm working with them, try to explain the fact that, that you know, um, what has happened. But the reality is, is that there are commissioners on the record from statements that they made. And, and at this point, um, you know, I think the Japan community would like to just get this over with. And I actually don't think it'll be a, a, a battle. I don't think the commit the Parks Commission is not going to come out and say no. You know, go with our recommendation. In fact, as John uh, Cicerelli is pointing out, I think the Parks Commission just wants an opportunity to say, hey, look, we didn't understand everything, and we're comfortable with Highlandville. <laughs> so if if we know that that's going to happen, why would I want to delay this and just upset the Japantown community even further? As far as I'm concerned. I don't, I don't care if we go back to the Parks Commission at some point and, and, and add it to a future, future agenda and say, hey, uh, allow them to, to speak their piece and say why. Or, as we know, um, it is not uh, right, irregular for us to be at odds with a recommendation from a commission and a council to take a different position. Um, and commissioners have the ability to, to speak up if they want to. And so I just, uh, I think the timing, John, is correct. Um, and traditionally, I would say, sure, let's, you know, there's no rush. In this case, I know exactly what delaying is going to do. It's, it's going to make things worse. And, and so that's why I don't want to delay. Yeah, if I could just jump in. I've had an opportunity to communicate with several members of the Japanese American community, and I concur with Councilmember Prowls's assessment. I, I know that commissioners feel very invested in decisions they make, and I appreciate that they're invested because we want them um, to, to feel uh, empowered to make decisions. But the reality is, this is ultimately the council's decision. Uh, and uh, I think we just move forward. And it's very clear to me, my conversations, actually I used to represent the area and I live near the area, uh, Japanese American community, uh, several of the leaders I've spoken with are very clear. So, uh, so I'll support the motion to reconsider. Um, anything further? All right, Tony. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo. Aye. Now on a motion to, uh, let's see, do we have a motion to change from a drop to consider? Uh, I'll make a motion oh. to add that to the previous motion, to add 7.1 and undrop it. <laughs> okay. Second, I think. The motion to undrop. <laughs> okay. This is Tony. We we didn't establish a date for 8.1 to come back. The following week is there's no meeting. Can I persuade uh, Councilman Camus to reconsider that as well, since we're no, on, the, on a roll? No, I, I, the, maybe the 22nd with the rest of the housing stuff. The 22nd meeting is with w when it falls in line with the rest of the housing uh, stuff. Okay. Um, so the vote on that, Arenas? 
Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Locarno? Aye. Okay. Now we're moving. Um, item E is the public record. Motion to note and file. Mr. Brinkman? Second. Thank you. Um, it should be fairly understandable that everyone is accounted for and taken care of at the local level with the issues of food, shelter, and health in this time of COVID-19 and emergency, as it may take a couple more years to modify and slow its spread. Uh, both apartment and commercial owners are getting what seems as full forgiveness ideas with future mortgage subsidy plans uh, from several California state bills at this time along with other tax and accounting formulas that AB 1436 and similar California state and Senate assembly bills are offering at this time. From all of this good news, how can full forgiveness plans be given to tenants as well? Most apartment and commercial business owners know how financial systems and continual money-making systems can work, yet it is being demanded tenants repay a full debt burden to this financial world. When tenants and people who need to have who tend to have more limited amounts of money uh, and do not have much knowledge of how financial systems can even work. Why is it that tenants cannot ask for full forgiveness at this time as well? California State uh, AB 1436 has been gaining in popularity. I very much hope it's good intentions and tenant rights ideas and bills like it can work to keep the language of their bills open to full tenant forgiveness ideas to more than just one year possibly using two-year, five-year, and 10-year increment ideas. With love, care, and good reasoning, it is people at the local and state level that will have to find ways to heal yet another mistake in long-term social planning and engineering at the international level with the issues of COVID-19. Good luck to all of our continuing good efforts here at the local level and where owners and tenants can work together on, cur on current California bills. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, returning to the, oh, we do have a motion. Uh, let's vote, Tony. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? All right. Item G1 is the consent calendar. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Okay, on the consent calendar for rules committee reviews, recommendations and approvals, uh, Mr. Beekman, but specifically on those items. Mr. Thank you for asking. Does this have the uh, women's equity issues? Or not women's equity, but e equity issues. I don't believe so, unless you believe a litter pickup or um, a breastfeeding awareness month. Well, certainly everything could be equity. Uh, Mr. Beekman, do you want to <laughs> speak specifically you. on these items or just more generally about something unrelated to these items? <laughs> well, I wanted to, I, I, you know, uh, litter pickup is always an important item and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, on, the, on the motion, let's vote. Arenas? Davis? I actually, I raised my hand. Um, oh, Mayor. Mayor uh, thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to um, recognize while it's still August, I know by the time that this um, comes across council, it'll be uh, absolutely too late. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to um, say a couple of words about Breastfeeding Awareness Month. As you all know, today is Women's Equality Day. And uh, breastfeeding is also something has been shunned in the past and is something that um, some folks consider as private and we consider, we women, and most people consider part of nutrition for an infant and a newborn. And so I wanted to make sure that breastfeeding continues to be part of our um, uh, household conversations and that it's not a taboo and that in, we have equal access to um, breastfeeding resources as well as um, breastfeeding pods, which I'm really proud to say that our library is really close to implementing and building for many of our families based on um, 
uh, the amount of use uh, infants and children have in those particular libraries, you'll be excited to see that there's breastfeeding, there, there's going to be breastfeeding pods now. So I just wanted to raise my cup once again to uh, Women's Equality Day and also proclaim uh, and recognize Breastfeeding Awareness Month. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Yamas? Aye. Jones? Hi. Ricardo. Hi. All right, item two is the Advanced Strategic Expansion on Water Reuse in San Jose. Vice Mayor. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you, Mayor. So this item is on the agenda because um, I was approached by um, Valley Water to um, engage in a, a conversation and, and potentially a negotiation around water reuse and collaborating with with them in terms of developing programs, partnerships, and potentially a facility. Um, so those, those uh, conversations have been taking place between Valley Water and our, our city staff. Uh, we actually had uh, the last meeting was on Monday, and then they have another meeting scheduled in two weeks out. Um, we're not far along, uh, enough along to really bring something uh, concrete to council, but um, the city of Santa Clara uh, expressed a desire that we had some formal recognition from council on the negotiation and the negotiation process in order for them to be willing to participate. So um, that is why I, I put out this memo to uh, have it on our agenda. It could be on the consent calendar, but we just need to have something uh, formal to meet uh, the city of Santa Clara's uh, expressed desires. Okay. So yeah. I don't know if we have any speakers on that. So I'll, I'll just make a motion to accept uh, my memo and, and have it put on the consent calendar for the next uh, available um, meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On advanced strategic expansion water reuse in San Jose, we do not have any members of the public who'd like to speak. So uh, Tony? I think oh, Councilmember Camus. Hand up. Camus. Uh, your device is muted. There you yeah. Go. Okay. I don't know why it didn't click with the uh, the space bar. Uh, uh, just a quick question: Is this going to require any staff time? I, I'm okay with it on the consent calendar, and I, I agree with the direction. But is there going to be any staff time uh, commitments from this? Well, there already is. So yes, <laughs> staff is already. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is a um, a discussion and, and and work product that's already ongoing, council member. Yes. Okay. So so there's it's already green lighted is what I'm trying to say. Usually we get like a red light, green light, yellow light thing, and and uh, so you're saying green light is what I'm. Yeah. Asking. This is already. Right. This, 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 is already is, this has been an ongoing discussion, negotiation, and it normally once we have more uh, detail and it's farther along we would bring it to council, but because of the request from the city of Santa Clara, I just want to get it on, on our agenda to, to officially recognize, acknowledge that these negotiations are taking place. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, on the motion then. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo. Aye. Thank you. Item three is the health and equity task force recommendations. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Great. Hi, nice to be here. It's been a while. Um, I, uh, and I want to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak on the health and racial equity task force. Since May, we've been meeting with, uh, with uh, quite a stellar group of individuals who, by the way, are partners with us on a number of different um, items. But, but these are individuals who are boots on the ground, are community health care clinics, nonprofit organizations, really partners that have helped the city of San Jose further our agenda in terms of taking care of our residents. We've been meeting with, uh, with all of them since May. We've had a community 
a, a public community hearing with over 125 participants who have been alarmed by COVID-19 and its uh, impact on our communities. We hosted presentations by numerous representatives from the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, as well as the County and City of San Jose Emergency Operations Center to really give us an idea of what we were dealing with, the impacts, and how our residents were, um, were, were really uh, digesting the information from COVID-19. The task force sought to better understand the current health crises and address the disparate impacts of COVID-19 by race, particularly in hot zones, neighborhoods in East San Jose and South Santa Clara County. The disparities have only worsened and you've seen the headlines. You've seen our own statistics, our own data points since the beginning of the shelter in place for communities of color. For example, the Latino community is now facing infection rates that are double than that in the general population. We must continue to deploy the appropriate resources to meet the needs of our communities who are not only facing the disproportionate health impacts of the virus, but also the devastating economic impacts. While the majority of the recommendations are centered in the county's scope of work, there are some of the there are some that the city can continue to take action on and assist us with collaboration when it comes to the county. Our city has been a leader in the county and we need to spread the wealth and get other cities to adopt similar policies such as emergency sick leave. We also should support our state legislators such as assembly member Chu and Calra who are fighting to get additional resources to these hard hit areas. <clears throat> These are just some larger ideas in these recommendations. I'm hoping that you've had an opportunity to take a look at them that will not only uh, assist with the health and racial disparities, but today, uh, today, but for the long term, including countywide universal childcare, a housing collaborative court to provide an even playing field rather than the unequal treatment in eviction court, and reducing barriers to ensure our children and seniors are also getting fed. These recommendations can ensure that we can provide for those impacted by the virus or any other future emergencies. And we know that there are, there are more coming. We just saw this past week with the fires on the, in my beautiful East Hills, but all around the city of San Jose. The implementation of these ideas can improve our community as a whole and have us become more resilient in the future, a blueprint to avoid these deep, long lasting disparities that continue to slide into the wrong direction with deep poverty, homelessness, and the final outcome, unfortunately, which includes fatalities. I really want to thank the members of this task force. They were committed to showing up every single week to really address these disparities and put on their creative thinking cap. They put in very, very long hours uh, to work together and develop these recommendations directly from the community and the county and city staff that have participated in these many, many meetings to help us understand the response and have accepted feedback openly, by the way. Uh, thank you to city manager Sykes, Lee Wilcox, Angel Rios also for your participation. And of course, to our board of supervisors who allowed us to speak with their staff and our public health department for their support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for your work uh, in your leadership, Council Member Carrasco, and uh, your work with the community and all those in the community who uh, participated and supported this effort. Uh, going to the community, Michelle Liu. Good afternoon. This is Michelle Liu, CEO of the Health Trust. I really want to thank Council Member Carrasco for her leadership of the Health and Racial Equity Task Force. She had many things on her plate, but she made this work a priority. <laughs> I also want to encourage you to agendize this item for September 1st. In this marathon of a pandemic, health and racial equity remain urgent and timely, just as Council Member Carrasco noted. The task force members stand ready to continue to be of service and help, and we thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman. 
Hi, uh, thank you for this item. Um, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, I suppose in, in your talk of uh, the, the most recent task force you, you had uh, with this item, um, the work of uh, the Human Services Commission uh, should always be commended and thought of. I don't know uh, what part they played in this task force, but uh, I'm sure they're around. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're a really good group. And uh, I thanked them yesterday. Um, and I guess it's time to thank them again. And uh, I, I learned really important lessons from them. And I, I wanted, I didn't mention yesterday uh, that um, the work from the county uh, with women's issues uh, from say 2014 to 2018, I think was really exemplary uh, for all of us. And they've, they've created a really good template and model how we can move forward uh, in, in thinking with women's issues, uh, for instance. Um, how that will relate to, you know, you've been studying equity in San Jose for the past few years now. You've created a new equity office department of equity. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit worried that all the internal work that you've done, that I, I'm guessing is really, really good work and you're ready to bring it to fruition. You know, it might be a little sterile and formal with this formation of a new uh, department. And I, I'm sure you're aware of this and you're trying to work out the kinks and the problems with it. And I wish you luck because this Office of Equity, I think is our, you know, it's an important concept for the future of San Jose. And uh, I hope we can all organize ourselves and, and, and use our good ideals and, and good practices uh, for this department. And we'll all be considering its, its good uses and uh, contributing to it. So thank you for this work and these efforts and uh, good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sarita Coley. Yes, hi, thank you. This is Sarita Coley, CEO of Aki. And I uh, just wanted to say thank you to the leadership of uh, Council Member Carrasco and Assembly Member Chu for convening the Health and Racial Equity Task Force and really highlighting the work that needs to be done and done with a sense of urgency for our most severely impacted community members, particularly in East San Jose. Um, as someone who leads a community clinic in East San Jose, we do really appreciate uh, the work of this task force and have already seen improved coordination and communication uh, with the Department of Public Health and with the city and county. Uh, but we know that there's a lot more to be done and has to be done now in terms of clear, simple messaging in language about you know, contact tracing or testing, uh, the importance of testing about how resources are to be used by somebody that needs to isolate. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and it has to be done soon because, uh, you know, as we know, along with the pandemic, there's also the fires, and um, it feels like 2020 is, is really dealing a stiff blow or many blows to our already impacted community members. So I would really urge you all to please agendize this item for full discussion on September 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering why on earth we had San Jose PD in Santa Cruz County enforcing law and we don't have enough people here to give patrols from midnight to 6 a.m. Sure, that's not the item we're uh, considering at this time. Okay, Jeffrey Buchanan. I'm Mayor and Council, uh, good afternoon. Um, would like to encourage your support for placing this item on the agenda. You know, certainly would like to thank uh, uh, Council Member Carrasco and uh, Assembly Member Chu for their leadership. Um, I think as an organization, working partnerships and, and certainly the labor movement, you know, we've really seen in, in this crisis, the, the overlap between uh, racial justice, uh, the folks that are most impacted by, by COVID, the, the folks that are uh, neighborhoods that are disproportionately likely to be uh, home to uh, low wage essential workers and disproportionately the, the same neighborhoods that are likely to be making calls to things like our COVID assistance na navigation program as a county. Uh, 
trying to figure out how to get unemployment insurance, trying to figure out how to get rental assistance. You know, it's those same set of East San Jose zip codes where really the, the health, the job loss, and just the kind of structural inequities of uh, the kind of uh, abuses faced by low wage workers where we have most of this risk. And so I think uh, the recommendations before you really bridge what do we do to really focus on the public health, on strengthening things like we've begun to do with our paid sick policy here in San Jose and really protecting those sectors of workers uh, that are most likely to be at risk and on the job site. And then when they go home uh, to live, you know, possibly in multi-generational families and overcrowded situations uh, and in neighborhoods where we, we have seen real spikes in the, the, the greatest of the public health risk. So, uh, appreciate all the work of all the folks on the task force and hope that the council uh, will take this, what I think is a pretty strong list of recommendations into account. And again, you know, really appreciate uh, the, the council member, Council Member Carrasco, putting this together and really leading the way. Uh, Helen Casa. Hi, my name is Helen Costa and I'll be speaking on behalf of Milan Valentin, the executive director of the AACSA um, and member of the Health and Racial Equity Task Force. Um, I'm here to highlight the urgency of implementing the task force's recommendations. As we work to manage and contain the spread of COVID-19, it is critical we utilize a racial lens. Racial disparity is a systemic issue and has consequences that affect the entire community, not just direct victims of systemic racism. We must support the task force's action items of supporting our most vulnerable community by promoting and investing in accessible testing sites as well as contact tracing in order to minimize further expansion. The city must also invest in supporting all community engagement efforts to educate the community on COVID-19. We must also recognize that our essential workers are most at risk, disproportionately affecting blue collar and low income individuals. Lastly, we must recognize the economic impact of COVID-19 on this community and prioritize investing in quarantine housing, uh, access to healthcare and necessities like food and hygiene products by supporting nonprofits and other organizations like the AACSA who are currently champion championing such efforts via our CARES program. This is a true opportunity for San Jose to address some of the health and safety implications of systemic racism that has been amplified by this COVID-19 pandemic. This being said, we at the ACSA urge you to support and execute on each and every recommendation made by this task force. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back to council. Uh, I'm sorry, to the committee. Um, I know there are many recommendations in here. Uh, not all of them, of course, relate to the city, just a few. And uh, some of them, I, I know that, for example, there's a report on food distribution. Councilman Carrasco, I assume your intention is not that that would have to come back immediately. That would be sometime in the future. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. So so the recommendations, of course, are for, for our staff and, and uh, to determine what is, uh, the needs of the community in, in the moment and what the needs of the community will be. Uh, and of course, that's gonna be an assessment to be had. But, but, a, but a lot of this is also uh, for us to have, you know, one of the biggest issues, and we've, we've talked about this mayor and we spoke about it when we had the joint meeting with the county, was also to have a seat at the table as, as these decisions are being made you know, the decisions that are being made still in the public health department are being made without a lot of the voices that you're hearing um, from the equity health task force without them being there. And so uh, we're hoping more than anything to be able to still, we're going to be presenting this as well to the board of supervisors in an attempt to be able to open up some dialogue and have uh, that conversation uh, whether we get the support or not, it's yet to be told, uh, but we, we want to have that dialogue and we want to be able to have uh, a, an open communication. We know that COVID-19 is here. It's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and the decisions that are being made are still having a great impact on both the CBOs as well as on the residents. And uh, being able to, to include those individuals who, who have direct communication with, uh, with our residents is uh, a, is a of, uh, of critical importance in terms of how we how we move forward. Okay, I, I appreciate that, Councilmember. 
I, I should have been more specific. That there's a recommendation, for example, I, I'm just thinking about city workload here and how this moves forward. And I know Dave can probably speak to this, but for example, 2D, receive a report from City of San Jose about future plans for food distribution. I assume that's not expected right away. That would be sometime in the future. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Dave, did you want to weigh in at all? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, so we've certainly been uh, involved with uh, the development of this. Um, so what we would uh, you would see from us on, on next Tuesday is just a summary of kind of the city pieces of this. And, and I think um, we're not working under the premise that we have to have these things done by next Tuesday, but really what would be the plan for moving forward beyond that. Okay, great. Councilman Rez? Thank you. Um, so I just also wanted to thank all the speakers um, as well as the leadership of uh, Council Member Carrasco um, for the Health and Equity Task Force and the recommendations that we see before us today. I really think this today is an opportunity for us to end our part in this um, structural racism by having a strategic plan um, that informs us in terms of how to do that from different realms outside of uh, just what we do as a city of San Jose, but um, from a lot of folks who are in the um, community service agencies, as well as uh, health um, services. I think we need to look at this very um, comprehensively um, and, and have an opportunity to really uh, think about how, what kinds of policies do we really want to enact continue to enact. I think we've been doing a wonderful job. Can we do more? Absolutely, because future generations are going to take a look back and see what kind of policies led to whatever the future holds for all of us and for our children, right? And they're going to say either that we address those disparities um, or that we created some of those disparities or we continued with the cycle of disparities. And so I think this is a wonderful opportunity to have a real integration of, of health um, and equity and to bring a lot of those voices into what we're doing and continuing to inform us as we move along. I know that our um, staff administration has their own strategic plan and it's been very thorough uh, we've, we've informed it, we try to inform it every week. Um, we have a lot to say in, in how we represent our communities. Um, I think this is just another way uh, that our partners can integrate their voices um, in a very meaningful way, um, in a very strategic way in, um, in how we're addressing this pandemic. And so let's look at this as an opportunity for us to also be part of an ongoing uh, solution to um, policies of the past. And I move to approve. Thank you. Uh, was the motion already? I'm trying to remember. That, that uh, we had. We'll oh, second. sorry. I thought we didn't. OK. So second. Uh, OK. Uh, Councilman McKinnis. I just um, I, I'm, I'm aware that I asked for to defer 8.1 uh, because of the time um, commitment that we keep going to like midnight. Um, is there an idea of how long this um, conversation could go? Is, are we expecting a whole lot of public discussion? And would this not be better in a study session? I'm just asking Dave if, if he has ideas on this. Thank you, Council Member. Um, well, just a couple of things. We, we've been green lighting all COVID related items. You know, I think we've, um, as we got the, the recommendations from the downtown task force uh, from this effort and also anticipating something coming from the economic recovery group as well. So I, I do think it's important that the items move forward into our, uh, our, our system, if you will. You know, in this particular case, um, uh, as the council member Carrasco said, many of the items fall into the, the county's realm, but there are pieces that fall into our realm. And, and in many of these pieces, we, we already are working on aspects of them. So I think it's important to get it into uh, the discussion. I, I, I'm not, I could, I'm probably not the best person to say whether we're expecting a lot of community participation. Uh, from a staff perspective, this is, this is fairly straightforward. And, and um, what you'll see from us, as I said earlier, is probably a memo that just organizes the city pieces of this and, and uh, a recommendation that we weave them into our work plan. I appreciate that. I, I just 
recall hearing a number of 150 people showed up to the meeting, and, and I, I hope that 150 people don't show up to comment on this. But it, in any case, I'm willing to support it. I just wanted to hear, um, I don't, I, I, maybe uh, Council Member Carrasco, um, are you expecting a lot of uh, speakers to come to this? Are we allotting enough time? Yeah, if I may add, there was 125 folks that showed up because it was a public hearing. At that time, it was uh, really the the uh, initiation of the task force, and it was it was when everything was uh, you know wild wild west when uh, nobody knew what was happening. We were uh, you know people were were uh, and still are frightened, but at that time, people were really scrambling for PPE. They were scrambling for tests. The community care clinics were not well equipped. Uh, they were feeling very, um, you know, they they were feeling that they really needed a lot of support from uh, from everyone uh, that that you know had the responsibility of supporting them in order for them to continue doing the good work that they do, uh, so that they could tend to the needs of our residents. Uh, but individuals who who still didn't know truly what the what the guidelines were in order to stay safe. Uh, essential workers who were working, but they were being told to uh, shelter in place. So a lot of, you know, mixed messages, a lot of very confusing information that we were uh, sorting through. So, so the public hearing uh, drew a lot of attention because we were trying to get a lot of answers. Uh, I think uh, we're, uh, you know, a lot further down the road than we were back when we first had that public hearing. I think we have a lot of still a lot of questions that we need to ask, but but these recommendations come from a lot of our own investigative work and a lot of our research, a lot of uh, support that we've had from the city and the county in terms of getting those answers. And uh, so the recommendations come from uh, having informed um, uh, support from uh, from experts around us. And, and so I don't think that you will have that kind of uh, audience. Uh, you will have some folks that will uh, show up and they'll give their opinion and, 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 and support the recommendations. You won't have, uh, it's not a public hearing. But, but I, I will say this, uh, because, uh, because we're seeing the numbers that are going up and uh, you know, I'm keeping an eye on, on the dashboard on a daily basis. Our numbers are going up dramatically, especially from what we saw at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and it's not because uh, the tests are accessible, it's because the numbers are definitely uh, um, going up. And uh, this is a very serious uh, virus and it's, uh, and it's impacting our communities in, uh, in very dire ways. And so, we need to make sure that we we get these recommendations out. We need to make sure that our communities are safe. And we need to make sure that especially those that are the most vulnerable among us get the kind of information that they need in order to very potentially save their lives. And so it's, it's a very serious thing for the communities that don't have the resources that other communities have. No, no doubt. I, I merely wanted to make sure that we pay it the due attention that that it deserves, and I wanted to see if you wanted to maybe sp have a separate meeting all together, like a study session, and that was where I was going with this. But if you think that we could squeeze it into a council meeting, then I'm okay with it. Yeah, I don't think it's a, a study session because staff is going to be uh, responding to this. Uh, and so it really it's about uh, uh, our city manager, Mr. Sykes, uh, giving us the green, yellow, red. I don't. Because we've we've already done a lot of the work, I don't think it's a red light. But uh, but uh, Dave, you're you're um, you're going to be the the bearer of good news or, or, <laughs> or better news. good news or better news. I don't always feel that way. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll on Tuesday we'll be able to kind of organize this in terms of really what's in the city's realm and kind of where how it fits into the work plan and, and, and what's. Know, what's moving forward and, and, and what we may take a little more time but that that's the plan and really what the task force is asking in terms of a response is uh is uh in you know we're just asking that in in a written form uh similar to what council member perales had asked for is that you re respond so that we have an idea are we off base 
Uh, is this something that can be done? How can we cooperate with the with the county? And how how do our partners uh, be better partners? How do we all work together so that our communities are safe? And how our how we can also be supportive of our partners so that they can continue doing the good work that they've been doing. Okay. All right, uh, let's vote. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Much. Move on to item uh, four is uh, a memorandum from me uh, on the release of a police department video footage. Um, we'll go to Public, I know we've discussed this already, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, Blair Beekman. Thank you. Uh, I hope in the current questions of what can be public access to police department body camera footage during the recent protests can also help develop uh, how the everyday public uh, can eventually have better access to police body camera footage and day-to-day -day needs as well. The January 22nd, 2020 Rules in Open Government meeting has a public hearing. Uh, can an everyday person from San Jose who is currently uh, making a court appeal have body camera footage to help his defense case? It was ruled that day that he could not have the body camera footage. It also fell to the room that, uh, that day that this judgment could be very questionable. To bring out these questions in, out into the open, uh, of what can be the, the public's right to body camera footage seemed the initial intention, intention of the city of San Jose government and why they had the January 22nd public hearing in the first place. City attorney Richard Doyle offered some of his usual good legal direction where this conversation can eventually be headed. So overall, this is an issue that has already been on people's minds within San Jose uh, city government and community for some time now. The question, how can the everyday public be allowed more rights to body camera footage and in order to prepare for their own good, for their own court trials and with similar important needs and reasons. I hope the day-to-day -day legal questions can make for uh, some decent good connections uh, in, in the current public ask of pu public body camera footage in the extraordinary circumstances of community protests. Um, with how, 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 however much time I have left, uh, I have no time left, I have eight seconds. Um, thank you for uh, <laughs> me stuttering through, uh, listening to me stuttering through this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd be grateful if there was a motion to move this forward to the September, I think it's the 15th meeting where we'll be considering other police related matters, Dave. Okay. That's all moved. Second. Okay. Great. Any discussion, Council Member uh, Aranis? Um, uh, I'll be supporting the motion on the floor. I just wonder, um, and I appreciate your um, memo uh, for the three videos um, to be released. How do? We, how is? How are those? How is it going to be determined who whose video is is released? Is it every um, police officer that ha captures any? of those three videos. Um, so we'll have multi-video uh, montage, if you will, of one incident and then the other and then the other. Uh, how yeah. do we determine? I believe what I proposed here was that in those situations where we've got a lot of different officers, body-worn cameras, that uh, the department simply select the three that get the most, the fullest, um, uh, the, the clearest shot, uh, that is the fullest uh, display of the event. Um, and, and so we don't have to produce 17 videos of exactly the same event, which would be a lot of wasted time and effort. Um, but certainly the council or the, the staff may decide there's a better way to do this. And I'm certainly open to that. This was really a first cut. And my sense, my desire really was to get this out the door, let staff and everybody think about how we can best do this. This would be a, a bit of a, a a, an attempt at a policy based on the state law that governs public record act requests for critical incidents. I thought it was a useful guide to, as a starting point. And if we want to tweak it, then we can do that thereafter. 
Sure, I appreciate that. I'm just wondering, um, I, I know that um, we're asking the, uh, the police department to make their own decisions on which of these videos are released and how will we prevent um, bias in the footage release? I mean, will somebody from the city manager's office also be in the room to help determine that? Or um, are we all going to be um, okay with just uh, allowing uh, our police department to determine which videos get submitted and released? Uh, um, so thank you, council member. Uh, th this question is for me. Um, so I think there are still details to work out. And you know, I think we, we, in essence, began this discussion at council a couple of weeks ago, um, where police chief and I were kind of talking through the understanding the value in doing this and so committed to doing it, but also recognizing there's kind of the, the, the what and the how. So still things to work through. I do think this provides some um, some general direction that we can kind of work with and work through. Um, but recognizing the point you're raising is, is a good one. Um, you know, I think we'll want to do it obviously in a credible way in what we release um, so that there's not, you know, the belief that um, we're trying to spin a story by releasing, you know, certain video and not other videos. So we'll, we'll need to work through that. I don't have all the answers right now, but. Um, you know, I do think um, there, there is value in moving forward. Yeah, and if I, if I could just add, all three of these incidents are, are pretty well circulated on social media at this point. So folks have a pretty good idea what's involved. Um, and certainly it will be visible as to whether there are other officers who are nearby. And so I don't think it's gonna be terribly difficult if someone thinks that we're, you know, the department or the city manager's office is trying to hide the ball somehow, it'd be pretty obvious for everyone to be able to see because there'll be officers will be visible in the frame and people will ask, well, why, why not their camera if we, people are really convinced that their camera is going to yield a better view. I, I don't think this is going to be an issue. These are three items where there's been plenty of video already. And I just want to get something. I agree out. with you, Mayor. Uh, the one incident that I'm thinking about is the police motorcycle incident that may, um, uh, the video uh, worn cameras may um, render better uh, uh, footage than what we have so far um, and may determine exactly what would happen because um, that's still a little bit up in the air in terms of uh, the, the recount of, of, of that incident. Um, and so I, you know, I just hope that uh, it sounds like the city manager is already having the, these considerations and the decisions that you're making, and I'm sure that you will come to the right decision. Um, I just want to make sure that um, there, there's somebody else in the room that can help determine that. Not, not because I mistrust the police department in not making the right decision. It's just, um, I, it goes along with what you're saying, Dave, about um, um, building confidence in our community that we're not trying to spin a story or that we're not trying to frame a story in a certain way. And so I think just um, to build, uh, to continue to build trust with our community, I think it would be safe for us to, to um, consider uh, somebody outside of the police department to be included in that process and not necessarily make, maybe making those determinations, but being part of the process for sure. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. I, so I, I I mentioned, the, I think the last council meeting, somewhere along the line that really our plan in terms of, you know, um, committing and driving this work is, is to really have um, Jennifer McGuire and Angel Rios co-lead for the, for the, the city effort. So they're gonna both be involved. They, they both bring different um, and very good skill sets to the table here. And so, um, they, they will be involved with how we, how we do this work, working with the police department, uh, working with the IPA and, and working with our new Office of Racial Equity. Wonderful, thank you. All right, uh, any other comments? All right, let's vote. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, item H2 are additions to the uh, Neighborhood Services Education Committee work plan. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, 
Mr. Bakeman. Uh, when I pulled up this item to, to read into it, it basically said that there isn't going to be a work plan for the fall, basically with, with uh, it said something to that effect. Uh, because of COVID-19, there isn't much updating to do. <laughs> And, um, you know, it just really reminded me that, you know, COVID-19 is a big pain in the butt. And I don't think it's really has been worth it, uh, you know, in its hopes and promises for our long-term future goals and ideals. I don't think, uh, you know, I hope we're learning important lessons. Uh, you know, the first things we learned from this time period we're in is the importance of positive sustainability ideas and that we really can work on those concepts and how to build our social planning future. And that can be a future where we don't have to hurt and harm each other anymore. I mean, we can negotiate, we can have dialogue and, and, and develop our better persons and better practices. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really important concept to myself right now. And, and we have to use that thinking in talking about say housing issues and stuff, because you know, at the local level, these things are not our fault, what has happened with these with the COVID. And I thank yourselves that you're making the efforts uh, you know, to to you're 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 aware of that yourselves and you and you and you want that to be understood that you know what has happened on the international level is on a different scale than what we care about and think about at the local level. And they have to learn that at the international level, basically. So we're developing interesting housing ideas and rental forgiveness and owner forgiveness ideas. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you. Uh, back to the committee, Councilmember Rance. Actually, I didn't raise my uh, my uh, hand. Well, blue hand was sticking but, up. Okay. Yeah. But, but I actually would um, actually now that you called me, I would like to clear up and maybe uh, Dave, you you could also help me with this. But the 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 um, the item that Mr. Bigman was talking about is for the neighborhoods commission. They weren't able to meet the whole year because of uh, COVID, and so that's the reason why some of that is dropping off. And it's not the uh, neighborhood services and education committee work plan. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, let's vote. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Uh, I believe we're now on to the um, request, the appeal on the Public Record Act request. Is that right? I'm misplaced mine. I believe that's correct. Yep. Okay, so I believe Romer, Robert, uh, Robin Rummer has an appeal. And Nora, forgive me, what's the process here? The appellant has how much time? Um, I, I thought it was five minutes to go ahead and present their argument okay. or case. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Robin, I see your hands up. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for um, considering my appeal. And I understand that on a personal level, you're asked to make a difficult decision here. Councilmember Diep, your colleague, some of you might consider him a friend or an ally. He's asking you to keep something secret and I'm asking you to make it public. Why shouldn't you side with your colleague, with your friend? Let me give you three reasons. First, legally, and according to the city's own rules, it is clear that Councilman Medieff's memo is a public record that should be disclosed. If Councilman Medieff had scribbled down some notes on a piece of scrap paper laying around, that is what would be a so-called preliminary draft not retained in the normal course of business. This memo is a lot more than that, and even if it weren't, the city's rules are clear. Once a suggested action is made public or presented for action by any city body, all related preliminary drafts, whether in printed or electronic form, shall be subject to disclosure if they have been retained as of the time the request is made. That is the case here. And of the, on the deliberative process privilege that Councilman Medea claims for himself, the city guidelines are clear again. This doctrine permits decision makers to engage in general discussions with their advisors without the fear of publicity. 
When Council Member Beard decided to share his memo with people outside of his own staff, he stepped outside of that framework. As you can see, staff and Council Member Diaz make little effort to try to refute these legal arguments presented in more detail in my written appeal. Council Member Diaz instead seems to argue that it is his decision alone which records he will make public and which he doesn't. Anything he doesn't want to make public, oh, that was just a draft. He shared it with other people. So what? He was just asking for feedback. That is just not what the law and the city rules say. And I'm sure you've, if you've been around long enough, there have been similar situations where you would have liked to keep similar correspondence private, but were told to risk loss. I can think of a recent example of text messages from a task force chair. Second, there's an elephant in the room that adds urgency, and I'm sorry to having to address it. I've had numerous council members and their staff tell me that under San Jose's unofficial mini mayor system, in cases of local projects, they would generally defer to the local council member instead of evaluating the project in depth independently. For example, the car wash we discussed yesterday. This is obviously not absolute or without exceptions, but it is such a common practice that numerous people have been brought up to. I don't wanna to go too deep into a discussion of this mini mayor system, but let me say this. Regardless of rightfully or wrongfully, Councilman Medea has an outside influence in the case of Chorka. And because of that, his opinion deserves extra scrutiny. We, the public, need to have an opportunity to refute the arguments he makes behind closed doors, especially if he is making them to other decision makers. Councilman Camus's office wrote to the community a week after the Sharkot decision to me and others. In hearing your and your neighbor's concerns, I wrote, your representative, Councilman Medeab, issued a memo calling for approval of alternative F. His office further writes, Councilman McCamus and the majority of the council agreed with your council member's assessment of the merits and strategic importance of the project and voted to approve Diab's memo with added verbal direction. Quote end. If this memo is important enough for Councilman McCamus to bring it to the attention of the community, it is important that we are able to see it for ourselves. By keeping his memo secret, Council Member Diab deprives us of that opportunity and the opportunity to openly challenge his arguments. Councilman Medea should have published this memo, any memo, before you all voted on shortcut. That is what Mayor Licardo and Councilman Bartholi did yesterday before the discussion about the simple car wash. Disclosing it now after the fact is the least we can do. And that brings me to my third and final reason. I also believe, and I'm purposefully going broad here, in a democracy, the people have a right to know what their elected representatives think and why they voted the way they voted. Public record laws are in place to ensure that that is possible. If Councilman Medea wants to keep certain thoughts for himself, that is obviously perfectly fine. But putting them down on paper and sending them around makes them public record. That is just the law, and you and Councilman Medea need to uphold it, even and especially when it is uncomfortable. Keeping each other honest, that is what good colleagues do, it's what good friends do. Please remind your colleague, Councilman Medea, especially if you consider him a friend or an ally. Please remind him of his duties as our elected representative. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mayor, you're, you're muted. Thank you, returning to the panel, thank you. Uh, Nora, just a question uh, for you or anybody on your team. In your experience, has it ever been the case that a draft memo that's passed back and forth between council members um, has not been a document that over which the city attorney would ex exert a deliberative process privilege? In well, other words, aren't those always considered deliberative processes uh, if, it's a, if it's a memo that's exchanged between colleagues on the council? Um, there, it, it, it certainly can fall within that exception. And um, I think typically um, as, as council members are trying to work their way through some issues and uh, the purpose of the deliberative process is to allow information and, and allow you to um, think through aloud, uh, whether speaking or in writing. Um, so that, I'm sure there have been occasions when people have been willing to waive the privilege, but it does exist and it is and it is asserted. Okay. And if I could, Mayor, I just want to make yeah. sure that um, you know we issued a 
a staff report. We want to make sure the rules committee has that. Uh, we are recommending denial of that. We have uh, Amanda Orozco here, our open, um, what's your title? <laughs> open government manager. Sorry, Amanda. <laughs> okay. We've got a lot of titles around here. Um, <laughs> but Amanda's here to help kind of understand uh, our recommendation if you have any questions for us. I'm sure, Amanda, did you, did you want to speak? Um, just to reiterate that um, we're here today to ask you to deny this appeal from Mr. Romare. Um, after discussions with Councilmember Dieppe's office, uh, we decided to hold the document or withhold the document as a preliminary draft and also under the deliberative process privilege. Um, and that's just because the public interest in non disclosure of the memo um, outweighs the public interest in disclosing it. Um, we just thought it would have a chilling effect on the council member's ability to have discussions about policy matters um, within his own office and with other um, council offices. And uh, releasing this, you know, type of document could expose his decision making process. Okay, Council McGinnis. Yeah, and I, I also want to apologize for me, me misspeaking. We saw the draft recommendations from Councilmember Dieppe, and and I think we neglected to would to put the word draft in the email that we, we were quoted in. Um, we thought he was going to potentially go forward with it, and uh, we 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 were supportive of it, uh, the ideas behind it, and I think was pretty much what we got done anyway. Um, so. I, I will make a motion to deny the appeal. Second. Vice Mayor Jones. Yes, I just um, want to agree with uh, everything that's been stated. Uh, uh, my understanding and what I've been educated on by the city attorney is that we have the ability to put our thoughts in, you know, in writing. You know, we can have a. Um, deliberative process, engaging with our colleagues who are in our Brown Act to, um, to bounce off ideas. We can change our mind. We can, you know, go in a different direction. Maybe our colleagues might have input that we want to incorporate. So, I mean, it's the whole process. And if, um, if we're not able to do that, I'm, it would be uh, challenging in terms of being able to really come up and develop and craft really sound policy. So, uh, from a legal standpoint and from a, a process standpoint, uh, I could not uh, support the uh, appeal. That's why I second the motion. Yeah, I just offer, I know Mr. Rummer mentioned a couple, uh, had a couple arguments. One was about a mini mayor system. As I recall, that, that vote involved five council members who actually disagreed with council member Diep. So I don't think that was a mini mayor issue that arose. You'd have, typically have that if if all 10 other council members followed the lead of that council member, that's, that's not what we had. We had a very robust discussion, I recall, on the dais. So there's no question about that. Uh, and then uh, secondly, with regard to the delivery process privilege, I have never had an instance in which in my previous conversations with a city attorney in the 14 years I've been here, where a draft memo that was passed back and forth between council members that was never released publicly, that would be considered something um, that would not be subject to privilege. Uh, that is always considered in every, all of my understanding in every instance in which it's ever arisen, that's always considered part of the deliber deliberative process uh, and the natural discussion that happens among a limited number of council members. Everyone should remember there is a Brown Act, of course, so it's not the case that we can go around and get a majority consensus behind the public's back this is usually between a couple council members who are exchanging ideas. And then obviously those ideas either become public or they don't based on those council members' decisions about whether or not this is a good idea to get behind. And that's part of the deliberative process. And that is built into the law and that is part of the democratic process. All right, uh, let's vote on the motion. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? All right, uh, then we Wait, are it, on to- Sam, I didn't hear you. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, on public comment, uh, Ms. Speakman? Open forum.
Hi, to comment on uh, the public hearing, you know, good luck in, uh, in, in the judgment of this issue. Uh, you want to respect uh, your own privacy uh, within government, but uh, it sounds like this could have been an issue that uh, possibly could have been released, and uh, in the name of friendship on all sides, maybe in the future it can be. I hope it also can be respected uh, a certain degree of privacy as well. Um, speaking of judgment uh, calls, uh, on your item last night about the new, you know, people mover, you know, AV ideas uh, on the west side, um, I thought it was a bit in bad taste to, to be having that issue so soon after COVID has happened. And I tried to describe, and I'm not very good at describing, that you know, uh, VTA did a great job a few years ago describing you know the AV program itself was going to be causing you know serious disruption issues in the early 2020s, and it was clearly warning us. And it was such a great warning. I was very excited about how we were all preparing ourselves so we cannot be in this state we're currently in. But that didn't happen, and we are now in it. And I just feel it's a bit of bad taste that you actually are. Plant using this uh, measure, uh, you're going to want to plan with these ideas at this time. Thank you that Raul Perales and uh, Council Person Carrasco are on this uh, board team that are going to, you know, how can this uh, practices move to the east side? I mean, that's going to be, uh, that should be a, a, an important consideration. And, um, yeah, so that, that that's about that's about my feelings about uh, this issue um, about policing. Um, you know, be aware. You know, we're, we're the the ideas of equity in San Jose can really be our key in how we address the future of policing and and all and all of our important issues uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, person with the phone number ending four nine six three. Person with the phone number ending 4963, I think your, your phone appears to still be on mute. You have to punch uh, the asterisk followed by six. Asterisk six. Uh, thanks, Sam. It's Martha O'Connell. Prior to the meeting, uh, of the council meeting on Tuesday, I had sent an email to the council talking about concerns about evacuation, pointing out that the folks in my senior park uh, many of them are night blind, many of them do not have cars, many of them live alone, many are frail and disabled. Unfortunately, I was on another Zoom meeting, so I came late to the council meeting, but I think I, it was Councilperson Esparza and Davis. I could be wrong, but I'd like to thank them because they did mention the mobile home parks and the evacuation. I am still getting calls from seniors that are saying, what do I do if we're told to evacuate? And one of the staff members during the council meeting, and I, I missed most of the discussion, said, call 911. Well, that's just ridiculous. We're not even gonna be able to get through by calling 911 in, in such a situation. So I need, the city needs to, to produce some materials to send to the citizens now, in case we have to evacuate in the future, telling us what, what what we're supposed to do, how we can get help. The other suggestion was, well, you know, we can send in the VTA access vehicles, but the staff did admit during the, the discussion, what little of it I saw, that they don't even know where the folks are that are gonna need help. So I think the city needs to establish some kind of procedure where we can start putting in the data in a database where folks are that are going to need help and what we do when we're told to evacuate. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. All right. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everyone.